Good afternoon and welcome, everyone, to the second of this year's Push Assembly Critical Ideas panels on arts and access. My name is Peter Dickinson, and I am the director of Simon Fraser University's Institute for Performance Studies and a professor here in the School for Contemporary Arts. I would like to first of all acknowledge that today's event takes place on the unceded indigenous territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including lands belonging to the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil First Nations. This acknowledgement, which settler citizens like myself have learned to incorporate into opening remarks at events such as these, does not begin to address historical violence of continued colonial occupation of these lands. However, as a performance studies scholar who believes that speech does things, that language is always consequential, I believe that the repetition of this acknowledgement and the complicated feelings it may incite in different individuals is performing important cultural work, if only in momentarily unsettling, taken for granted assumptions about our sense of place. Critical Ideas is a partnership between the PUSH Festival and the Institute for Performance Studies that brings together artists, critics, scholars, and audiences to discuss formal, social, and ideological issues affecting performance, practice, and reception today. This is our fourth year partnering on this idea exchange, for which we also receive critical support from SFU Woodward's cultural programs, SFU's Faculty of Communication Arts and Technology, and for today's panel in particular, we'd also like to acknowledge the support of Van City. Before I introduce today's topic and our featured speakers, I would just like to remind you that there is one more panel that takes place over the course of the festival. Next Friday, February 1st, but at 10.30 in the morning this time, and in the cinema of this building, on the third floor, our final critical ideas panel will focus on ethics and consent. We're asking how, in creator, creator producer, peer-to-peer, -peer, and ardent artist-audience relationships, how can we foster practices of ethical consent and care in performance and curation? while also acknowledging the power structures that govern such relationships. Contributing to this conversation will be Lakulik, Williamson, Bathory, Evelyn Perry, who together are the creators of Kinelik, These Sharp Tools, Lee Su Fei, the Artistic Director of Battery Opera Performance, and Victoria Hunt, choreographer and performer of Copper Promises. Our guest moderator for this panel will be Renelta Arluk, Director of Indigenous Arts at Banff Center. Sorry, that was getting very heavy. Very much in dialogue with matters of care and consent, today's panel addresses an ongoing thematic and practical concern of the PUSH festivals, namely how a deeper and more meaningful focus on accessibility might help to change our approach to the creation, curation, and experience of art. Starting from a position of possibility rather than limitation, how might we work to build a more inclusive and intersectional performance ecology? Today's panel centers these questions around the experiences of deaf artists and practitioners and their allies in the disability arts community. 
Our speakers include award-winning theater and film actress Don Janie Beerley, who plays Horatio in Why Not Theater's production of Pris Hamlet, which continues through this weekend, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Ravi Jain, who is the director of Prince Hamlet and artistic director of Toronto's Why Not Theatre. Denise Reed, film and musical artist and owner and director of the Victoria-based ASLSQ Entertainment. And J.D. Derbyshire, a Vancouver-based theatre artist, storyteller, stand-up comic, producer, and all-around inclusive person. <laughs> We've asked each panelist to address the topic for approximately 10 minutes, after which we will open things up for general conversation and question. And uh, we're going to lead off with Don and Ravi, and then Denise, and then we'll finish with JD. Thank you very much. We're first. We weren't planning on being first, but we're going to do this. Can we repeat the question again? <laughs> repeat the question again. The question. For everyone's benefit. <laughs> so I, just that uh, focusing on this question of arts and access from possibility rather than limitation and centering that around, specifically in this instance, the experience of deaf practitioners and their allies. You want to go first? Me first? <laughs> I can go. Oh, I can all go. right. <laughs> Thanks, Ravi. I'd be happy to. <laughs> Okay, so, well, I'd like to start. Good morning. Our, hello, everybody. I'm happy to see such a great turnout. This is lovely. This is really good to see so many people come because I have long, my whole life, been, um, you know, really working towards hearing and deaf people working together. I think that, you know, we have a visual world and we have an auditory world. And I, you know, those are inhabited by deaf people and by hearing people, respectively. And I think that, you know, with all of the spoken languages uh, that are uh, out there and used by hearing people, we also have many signed languages that are used by deaf communities all over. And I think the bridges between these two worlds have been weak. Some of the bridges have been burned. And some of the bridges have never existed. And I feel that that, that that is a metaphor that really resonates. I think that that's why I'm here on the earth, to see how we can strengthen the bridges between our worlds and build more and more of those bridges, more and more of those connections so that we can engage with each other. I grew up in both of those worlds. I've seen, um, I've seen, I'd like to <laughs> emphasize that I've seen both worlds, not heard. Uh, and I've seen the challenges and the struggles and the frustrations that exist uh, when people are coming together. And I think that that coming together is really, really an important piece. And I think that, that you know, it, 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 there has been significant oppression that's existed in our world and, and it has held us back. And I think that many of the oppressed groups um, have not had the opportunity to have our voices heard. And so, I, for me, I believe that the arts are a platform to work towards positive change in this regard. P Peter said, you know, let's focus on possibility and not limitation. And I think, you know, I absolutely would endorse and agree with that. I'm born from into the third generation of deaf family in my family. My family is here today. My mother and my sister are here, and some childhood friends of mine that I was, you know, raised with are here today. And I think that. What that my childhood has taught me is that anything is possible. And when I confront people who, you know, approach me with a sense of sort of tragedy, oh, to be deaf, my response is, really? Well, I mean, actually, oh, to be hearing, how difficult this must be. Because I was born into a linguistically and culturally intact deaf family. And that has been my life. And my life is wonderful. My world is complete and beautiful. 
I love my people, my language, my culture, my community. And I can say that because I come from a deaf family and I have access to communication from the moment I was born. I was raised in Regina in Saskatchewan. And at that time, uh, there was a significant deaf community uh, really one of the, the largest in Canada until the time uh, when the School for the Deaf closed in, and really Saskatchewan became a dead province for, for deaf people. That central of our community was gone and the government has not done enough to support uh, deaf people and not only in Saskatchewan but across Canada. And I, again, I'm not here to discuss problems, I'm here to discuss possibility. So I want to keep that as my focus, but I do want to acknowledge there are difficulties. And I just, deaf people were in my world growing up to the extent that I thought the world was that. It was, you know, it wasn't until I was older when I realized I started looking around and I would realize People use their mouths to talk, and my parents had to explain uh, to me when I was old enough to realize that I wasn't the majority in the world. I wasn't part of the majority in the world, and there was an, an other majority that was foreign to me and new to me, but I encountered uh, when I started to, to realize that the world was not deaf. And when I entered into the arts, we, you know, we realized that we have <laughs> our community. We love to party, we love to, to perform, we have storytellers, we have humor, we have culture, we have literature, we have all the things that other communities have. Um, but our world is accessed through vision. And I think the hearing majority's world is accessed through their ears. And that is the thing that differentiates us. <coughs> But for me, I was raised with the belief that I can do anything. I can do anything and I have pr proven that. I really feel that that's been uh, an important part of my life. And so when I do confront those people who say, you know, oh, it must be so difficult to be deaf, my answer is always, you know what? My life is wonderful, but your attitudes are the struggle that we as deaf people deal with. This attitude that you, the belief that we can't has created the obstacles for us. And it's the system, it's the system. And then this is not just here, but across the world, it's the system. And I have traveled the world and I have traveled in first world countries and developing countries. And around the world, it is the thinking and ideology of hearing people that is really common across countries. And those, you know, that's where the decisions get made for us and they don't work for us. So there are, you know, it's a long list of these, these, you know, pattern of obstacles and struggles, but the barriers come not from our lives, not from being deaf, but the barriers are imposed on us by systems that don't incl include us, that don't, uh, that aren't accommodating of our way of life. Um, yeah, and I, I would build on that, that I think that a major barrier, surprisingly, in the theater is uh, uh, is the imagination, and f for for the most part, the theater world is a very conservative world, and it's exciting to have a conversation like this because I feel like the where we are at in the conversation of the arts and representation is really not only challenging those ideas because people have been challenging those ideas for a very long time, but now it feels like uh, the barriers are now, uh, uh, we're seeing a, a change actually happen. Um, so my, uh, the company that I'm part of, Why Not Theatre, in our name uh, is this idea of, uh, uh, of challenging possibilities. Uh, why not is the phrase you say when you encounter any limitation, you imagine another possibility. And it really has come out of my life as I started as an actor and for so many years, I was challenged with the fact that I wasn't, I didn't feel I was being given the opportunities that I felt I was capable of achieving. And my race was a barrier to, to um, just another vision of the world. And I've encountered that with a lot of, of people with gender, race, and abilities. We know, we know these things now, but... Uh, prior to this conversation. <laughs> For a lot of people, uh, it wasn't a thing. And um, 
Uh, I was going to say, yeah, so, so constantly challenging that uh, for me as a younger actor was, was part of my life. And I met uh, uh, a South Asian director from England who was a pioneer for South Asian arts in the UK. His name is Jatinder Verma. And he was giving a talk and he said, you know, uh, he was frustrated with being called a culturally diverse company. He said, all theater is culturally diverse. That white theater that's doing white plays, they're culturally diverse too. They just have more money than we do. <laughs> and he said, you know, what was a driving passion for him was that our roots, when we, when we d dove into our roots, our traditional roots, we found different routes of creation, different roots, play on the word roots, and that actually his identity as a culturally specific South Asian artist unlocked his work to actually be part of the avant-garde, that it was about different ways of creation, that actually accessing your roots and other people's cultures and roots um, and perspectives unlocks a possibility for a different type of imagination, a different form of communication, and, and just increases the, the um, colors and textures that you're painting with in, in the theater, the way you're telling stories. And so working with Dawn has been a, a tremendous uh, artistic growth for me because it's encouraged me to really see a different way of seeing, uh, literally. Um, and uh, fundamentally, what's been a, a fascinating learning for me is our conversation started around language. So taking an old play like Hamlet, which is, you know, a stalwart classical play, the, you know, a, a play that represents so much to our ideas of what theater is. And we started by um, conversations of language. And what I realized into the process is actually it was, it was as much about language as it was about culture. And that that conversation that we've been having about deaf culture and deaf language um, in a play like Hamlet has been really exciting to unlock um, not only how we receive the play, uh, but also I think I can speak on behalf of all the artists involved, uh, opened up all of us to a, 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 just a different kind of uh, engagement with the text, the play, and the performance. And so, uh, I say that, I share that all to say, uh, you know, f for me, it, it's, it's as much about um, th the more inclusive we can be, the more perspectives we have at the table, the better art we make. Um, and it's hard. It's absolutely, it's very, very, very hard. There were a ton of challenges. And the major access challenge that, and I'm going to speak on your behalf here, for Dawn, Dawn's actually Canadian, but she lives in Finland. Uh, because the, um, the supports for deaf artists in Finland are far greater. So uh, there's more work there. Uh, uh, so Don has a lot of experience as, as not only an actor, a translator, a performer, a powerhouse. Um, but she also has two interpreters with her at all times. And so in the process of working with Don, we as a company were able to actually work with her because two interpreters full time were provided to us, paid by the Finnish government. So that's a five week rehearsal process and a three week performance. And now we've been on the road for three months, yes? And if I could just add to that, uh, in Canada, this would never happen. The, the costs are extreme. And uh, we're very privileged to have that access to be able to communicate with Dawn, to be able to have that time uh, is a huge barrier to actually being able to do this in, a, in the right way. And by right way, I mean um, uh, authentic and equity of power at the table. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's, been, that's been huge. And it's, again, unlocked for us uh, not only this play, uh, a process. We've worked on, we're working on a number of other things. Uh, 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 the play itself, the, the process, and I would say um, uh, just really shifted how we're thinking and seeing and thinking about audiences. It, the dominoes are always uh, so great. There's not only the, the actors, there's the audience, there's the reverberations of that. So yeah, so I'll just, I'll stop there.
that we'll, I'm sure we'll have more to say yeah. later, Ravi. Hello, everyone. It's a large turnout today. You give me so much energy up here. And it's a real honor to meet Ravi and Dawn and to hear their exchanges. Um, and I know that we will be working together in a, in a short time. I think our goals and passions, uh, actually listening to the two of you, are the same. I'm raised, born and raised in Quebec, in Montreal. I use LSQ, a langue des signes québécoise, to communicate. And um, I knew I always wanted to collaborate, work alongside the spoken English, deaf, ASL English, and the LSQ, or the French community. My father is hard of hearing, my brother is deaf, and so my environment has been visual from the get-go. Um, my mother n was not deaf, and people like we've heard already would come up to her and say, oh, it must be difficult to have a deaf child or whatnot. She passed away, but you know, she dealt with that, and she was gracious about how she responded to that. But I always felt in my mind that, um, you know, this idea, well, there's so many limitations for deaf people. I, I don't buy into that at all. In fact, I think just the opposite. I went to school. I always wanted to be in theater. I always wanted to be on the stage. It was just a part of my genes. And, but I was always told, ah, not suitable, it's not gonna work for you. And I was, uh, you know, sort of gone off on different tracks for a while. And then I went off to Gallaudet University and made my way there. But I wasn't told that I was too late that I should give up, that it, it, and here I am, this is where I am, because I never gave up. So it's never too late to start on your journey. So anything, I can do anything rather, except here. And that's where I, I learned that, that motto or that belief from Gallaudet, as well as working as allies, regardless of uh, gender, regardless of race, uh, we have to work together. And that's always been my goal. As we heard earlier, we talked about bridges and that foundation that has been removed. And what happens is that people stay in their camps. It becomes sort of ghettoized or we're living in silos. To be a part of theater, I mean, actually one instance where I, went to, I was in high school and I was teaching uh, drama, one of, one of the students, a guy whose father did not want to have anything to do with sign language, wanted only oral communication. So that made it very difficult for someone who didn't want to communicate that way. So anyway, there's this one boy who didn't want to participate, and I could see he had the ability for sure. He had the facial ability, expressions and what have you, and he said, well, I think I want to be a part of this, which he did, and he started to pick up sign language. As a result, he just flourished. You could see his talent and his abilities, and his father was like, oh, I don't want my son to lose his ability to, to use spoken language. He rehearsed his dance routine. He performed in front of an audience of several hundred, in front of friends and colleagues and teachers. And, you know, he was nervous. And I told him, just be yourself. Just show them what you can do and forget about the rest. So this was, in, of course, in Quebec. And um, the father was impressed. He couldn't believe. He didn't even realize that that's what his son could do. And he, 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 was, he was so good at that, I think he brought tears to his father's eyes. And I think realized that, yeah, this is the way for my son. He has to learn sign language. So that moment was trans transformational. So theater, it speaks volumes. How you are on stage and, and also, in this case, the family didn't realize that he had this ability. And he's done very well for himself. So that's, you know, all these moments that, you, that come across your way, like you, we talked about barriers. Barriers don't impede us. You know, I've been doing this for many years. I'm 60 years old. I am not in it anywhere ready to give up and to quit. You know, I will do it because my heart tells me this is what I want. This is who I am. This is, what, this is my guiding light. And that's where I want to be. And I won't let, you know, limitations get in the way. No one can ever tell me they can't do it or because I'm deaf, therefore I can't. I always think possibility. You know, I'm a human being. Regardless of whether I hear or use sign language to communicate, I can do anything. So if you believe in yourselves, because you have that innate desire, then everybody else that you come across who you think can't do it has that same innate desire. You must believe them and trust that they know this is what they want. And as we heard earlier on, our world is incredibly visual. We have hands, 
you know, you use your voice, you have, your voice has an intonation to it. We do the same thing with our hands and with our eyes. So as you hear sounds, you get meaning from that. The same way as what we get, we get meaning from our visual world. So we each have our, our modality of communication, but, and the structures of ASL or the rules of ASL are very different from that of English. Yeah, and our government system, I'm sorry we're getting into politics here, but our <laughs> government has a lot to do with that. You know, they're incredibly oppressive and powerful. They dictate, you know, they say words like, oh, you're hearing impaired. You know, no, I don't, I don't subscribe to that terminology. I'm deaf. And of course, those terms or that terminology has such an influence on our community. You know, regardless of, of you know, how we identify ourselves, the system that tells us who we are is what impedes us. You know, don't look at what the government has to say about us. Talk to us. Listen to us and work with us. And then we can push back and we can speak back to the government. And, and let's not be, you know, uh, hoarding power and, and working in silos. Let's just change the system and work together. Because I know that if we do that, everything will change. If we don't want to make those efforts, then things will stay isolated and we will work on our separate camps. And I think what we have to remember is that we're human beings here. You know, this earth has full of diversity, full of multiple languages and arts. And we have so much here at our disposal. But what's missing is the barrier or the communication barrier. That, that's what gets in the way. People who look at us as a person with a disability is, gets in the way. You know, if we were a, a, a world of deaf people and two hearing people came along, well, imagine how those two folks would feel. You know, I, wouldn't, I don't consider myself as having a disability. I have a, a rich language and a culture. You know, that's tremendous. You know, an alien from another planet might come along and say, well, who is this? Well, we're not the ones with a disability. And I don't know why that term seems to be continuously applied. You know, we have diverse abilities. We are not disabled. People who use wheelchairs and use other devices to get around have different abilities. You know, Romeo and Juliet, for example. I'll show that, I have a, a slide up here. And I also wanted to make sure that we had a, a diverse uh, cast. We had, we had the Capulet family, of course, and then we had um, Montagues, right? Of course, they were a warring family, those two of them. And it's the same thing as with you know, other languages. We had sign language interpreters on the stage. We had a, a, a variety of, of abilities. We had ages 14 to 60 on the stage. Uh, we had people with uh, learning disabilities, so to speak, people who were blind, all brought together in this production. And so we rehearsed for a year. We performed it. And we brought a number of guest uh, and audience members in. And Romeo and Julie, Julie, Romeo was the deaf-blind person. And Romeo, uh, I don't think people even recognized this person was blind, pardon me. And uh, we had the stage, uh, we had the stage done up. And um, this videographer who came on said, wow, that signing was beautiful. And and person said, I, I this is a deaf-blind person, said, I couldn't see what I was doing. They were shocked to realize that this actor, Romeo, was deaf-blind, which, which goes to say that, of course, we can do it. You know, and so now they're quite involved in theater. So the, the message is, take, believe, believe in yourself. Don't listen to what other people have to say to you. You know, follow your passion. Don't worry about the labels. Look at what you have, what your skills are, and use them, you know? And, and don't be judging other people. And yeah, thanks. And when I went to theater school at Gallaudet University, I was in a deaf theater school. I went off to University of Ottawa to a hearing theater school. Very, very different worlds. I learned from both. Um, I had an interpreter or two interpreters in my classroom. People were interested in me and they wanted to know, can you read lips? That's, that's the common question. I don't give people flack for that, but you know, it's a good question. I respond and I say, well, can you read my hands? <laughs> and it, so they're a bit, they're a bit stunned with that kind of response, but it's the same, it's the same message, right? Really. Um, this is my way of communicating and they didn't bother, but they actually thought maybe it was a silly question, but it's language. It's not about, you know, can I read your lips? If, if we can't communicate in the same language, then we'll find other means. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll write notes back and forth. 
I mean, I don't know how you, when you travel and you come across other countries and different spoken languages, how do you get a, along? You use your gestures, you point, you do things, you find a way to communicate. Well, that would be the same if you were to come across a person who uses sign language to communicate. So we're, we're all the same. I mean, I like we've heard today, you know, hearing deaf people, I just want us to be allies. Let's work together, you know? And, and we have to make those changes, you know? Changes happen through the arts, through theater, um, because you have a large, gathering of people there, they're going to be transformed by what they see, by what they experience. You know, instead of getting your posters and your placards and, you know, lobbying the government, that's one way, but I think theater is more impactful. You know, I think that's what's going to help, you know, change, change the tides. And um, I, I, I have something up here I want to show you. Just let me bring that up. So this is my company. Uh, I do film and music. I also... Uh, do ASL, sorry, it's called ASL SQ Entertainment, really, which stands for American Sign Language and Langue des Signes Québécois. That's the French sign language. So rather than putting two L's in there, I decided to give it that uh, company name. So ASL SQ, um, and it's an entertainment company. And as I mentioned, it includes the film and theater and music and a, and a variety of events. And the goal has always been to include hearing and deaf people, ASL and LSQ, and working together. So we're, we're making progress. We started this up last fall, and I would like to see it grow, for sure. And so, as you can see, I have a number of uh, goals that I established on that uh, graph, and this is my bio. It talks about where I, where I was raised and some of the barriers that I faced, just like we heard from Dawn. You know, like it just as I listened to your story, Don, I thought that's, yeah, I mean, imagine a, a, an artist who has a passion. I'm sure you all have your own passions here and you want to create something, but imagine being told all the time you can't do it, you know? And, but there are those who continue persevering and, and, and achieving what they want. But again, you need allies, you need people working with you and you, we want people to listen to us. And our language is incredibly beautiful. Our culture is rich. You know, if you're involved in the deaf community, you will, you'll get what I mean. And I know that your languages and your communities and your cultures are also rich and beautiful. So it would be nice to have a, a real mutual exchange and not have us on either side of the bridge and just watch that water go by us and never crossing for years. You know, we gotta stop that. We really have to stop that and start building that bridge and that foundation and start crossing over onto the other side of the bridge. That's my goal. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm JD Derbyshire. Um, I am here as an ally in the, a grouping that is called, uh, at least in Canada Council, Deaf, Disability, and Mad Arts. And, um, <coughs> If we talk about possibility, um, you know, I think the utopian, the new utopian idea is not to build the perfect world, but to strive towards unhindered plurality. And, and you know, how we get there, um, I think the arts have always been best at showing shared humanity. When I, uh, I saw uh, Prince Hamlet on uh, Wednesday, and um, it's um, a fantastic uh, bit of theater, and um, as an uh, artist advocate, thrilled me for a number of reasons. One was that um, the diversity included all kinds of variety. And so if we think about that word diversity, it's become a buzzword, but that's what it really means, is variety. So there were, um, you know, there was just such a variety of humanity on that stage, and that's how easy it is. <laughs> it was totally acceptable. Men playing women, women playing men, you know. Crazy ideas. <laughs> um, and just, it's that easy, you know. But to see um, what gets classified as a disability included in the diversity is, I think, one of the possibilities I'd love PUSH and Vancouver to look towards often in conversations of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, persons with disabilities are not uh, included. It's the same fight. And uh, with intersectionality, it's a separation that I, I challenge us all to um, question. 
So I think that things will change as we see the differences. If we, if we make models that people go, right, I saw that Prince Hamlet and there was all this variation without comment and there was uh, uh, multiple languages and um, uh, just this variety of ages and ethnicities and oh yeah, I saw that. Then what happens is this wonderful thing, that becomes a model and everyone goes, oh, that can be done. Of course, we are uh, privy to the secret of funding <laughs> that was part of how it happened. And um, this is another challenge with um, deaf, disability, and mad arts, that usually things cost more money and take more time. And um, I will take the burden of vulnerability as a person with an invisible disability. So I suffer from a brain injury and a learning difference that was um, for a long time uh, thought of as mental health um, diagnoses. If you want to learn that story, you can come see my show, Certified, which I uh, turn the audience into a mental health review board and they determine my sanity in 50 minutes and that'll be um, part of Touchstone season you know, this year. Um, but we need these models. If we're, if we're shooting for unhindered plurality, we have to ask ourselves, you know, um, why not? <laughs> and if it's money, um, I will say that um, the other thing that I enjoyed is I'd never seen a, a, a highly trained um, um, deaf artist. And so it is an artistry unto itself. What, what, we, what we don't have examples of is the aesthetic. Um, we have the accessibility, but not as aesthetic. So I'll never forget, I was with my partner and at the beginning of the show when you fall into your character. I've never seen an actor do that, um, that, that first moment. And I thought, this is why we need this. And this is why I could talk forever and it won't make a difference. But once we see that. So with other disabilities, um, I think that um, deaf uh, culture and artistry is leading the way because it is its own language, languages, because it has a culture. So other disabilities get lumped together and do not have a shared culture, do not have a shared language. So there we have to start thinking about things like one size fits one. And what I mean by that is if uh, most of our training institutes for art, for example, um, privilege endurance. So if you can do 12 to 16 hour days, you're gonna get your theater degree. And if you can't, you might not. I'm sure all of us in this room can think of incredibly talented people who didn't make that cut. And what a loss. We lose some of our best minds, our brightest imaginations, our most eccentric people, because they can't endure. And I don't think any industry anywhere is a better example of low pay and workaholism combined. So we're beginning to see some practices of disability arts where we elongate process, we elongate payments, we um, find ways that work best for the people we're working with. So one size fits one. It's not about bringing in a devised practice. It's about bringing in a devised practice for that particular group of people. And it is hard, but it is amazing. And we're seeing that come, come into mainstream conversations now. So, right? So small changes in disability arts, deaf, mad, and disability arts are coming into mainstream. And now I'm seeing things like, hey, why do we rehearse six days a week? That's really hard to have a family and rehearse six days a week. Or we see um, interruptions in career because of uh, pregnancy or having children. We see that we're able to fold in those people better. Now, pregnancy wouldn't be considered a disability, but that's leading the way in terms of um, changing our work practices. So there's many beneficial things. I think that we have to think really differently. We have to gather people that all across the country there's small experiments happening and right now we have no way of sharing them. I think it would be great for um, PUSH to host something like a swap meet where uh, disability artists from all kinds of practices because we do, we are really cross-disciplinary, come together and share solution about, uh, about some of the barriers, the way we've gotten through barriers.
I think the other thing I'd like to uh, challenge, because the word is possibility, is, you know, we, um, a lot of people with disabilities can't make it through training programs, but are, uh, so a lot of times we're creating and training at the same time. I would love to see uh, a couple of initiatives. I'd love to see a theatre company in town take on uh, what Mixed Blood did in uh, America, which is a company that uh, put up 10 plays that were written by persons of disabilities, uh, for persons of disabilities, and offered companies $10,000 if they would produce one. Um, and then the other thing is, there's a fabulous play called Colossal, which is about a, um, a young man who becomes a quadriplegic through a football accident, written out of Yale drama. And the playwright has made it a, um, a condition of the play that only a, a real a wheelchair user, a quadriplegic, can do the part. So as you can imagine, it doesn't get done very often. I'd love to see SFU uh, couple with maybe the Arts Club, and um, it's a fantastic play, and slowly train up people at uh, GF Strong over a couple year period. Uh, nice, a nice correlation between students and persons with disabilities. In the end, staging the play at, at the Arts Club. Um, we have to begin to see it as a virtuous cycle. Um, disability arts grew out of social service agencies and it still has a charitable lens on it. It still has this thing where we're going to go in and help these people. But within these communities that I've had the privilege of moving in and out of, um, there are incredibly talented artists um, that can bring this diversity, this unhindered plurality, that feeling of watching Prince Hamlet where you're like, this is what theatre does best. I'm, I'm surprised, I'm amazed, I'm riveted, and um, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Could I just build on two things you said? Um, I just want to uplift the challenge that you present. Thank you for presenting that challenge to this room of thinking about people with different abilities because I, myself, was at a conference when I was thinking about casting Hamlet, and I was only thinking about race and gender. And I was at a conference and someone said, I, I hope anyone in the room who's casting anything considers people with different abilities. And I went, shit, I'm, I'm thinking about that right now. And I went to Toronto, I went back home and immediately started emailing people and got in touch with Don right away. Yeah. We Skyped, we had one Skype call and I said, yeah, I think we should do this. But I wouldn't have done that if, I, if someone didn't present that challenge and I didn't see my blind spot. Um, so thank you for saying that and I just really want to echo it because there might be people here who are in a similar boat that I was. And I also wanted to add um, something that was really unique about our process in Hamlet when we first did it. So the play was done in 2016 and the Hamlet is played by a woman named Christine Horn and uh, she had just given birth to a baby six weeks and we started rehearsals and she had to play Hamlet and learn sign language. <laughs> um, and and, and, and uh, I, I share that all because uh, it, it goes to, I think, your last point about training. I think that, yeah, all of this is hard. And as long as the process is laid out to actually support people for success, which requires money, a different uh, one size fits one, I love that, that we're thinking about uh, we stop thinking cookie cutters and we start thinking about what, what do we need and what do the people we want to work with need. Um, and and that's, that was just a really, uh, uh, yeah, it was a great learning for us. I'd also like to, uh, to, to respond to your comments, uh, J.D. and Denise, uh, especially around the idea of diversity. I've had lots of conversations about diversity, but really questioning what is it that we mean with this concept. Often people talk about diversity, but don't consider deaf people in that range of diverse experiences. People talk about race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, that that is the range of things that are considered when people are imagining diversity, and deaf people are way at the very bottom of that list when people are imagining what that could look like. That's right, Denise is uh, agreeing. So I think another thing that we talk about is sometimes inclusion, and I'd just like to, 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 to raise that. If you look at the sign that's often used for inclusion, this is what it looks like. 
inclusion. And I'd just like to, 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 to really raise a challenge about that. I think that what we're talking about is inclusion, and we have to think about who's being included into what, because this is the sign that I use. This is the sign I use. It gets included, and then it spills out the bottom and gets lost. Because that's how I think of what happens when people get included in things. Because what it is that's being included is we're included into a system that never seems to change. So who is being included? By whom are they being included? And for what purpose and benefit? So we talk a lot about barriers and Inclusion is supposed to address those barriers, but I think in actuality the opposite happens and it in fact creates more and additional barriers when we approach things with this inclusion mentality. So for me, my experience, inclusion does not work. And so I rather support the idea of intersectionality and approach taking an intersectional approach and and Ravi and I can talk a lot about that um, I'm going to be doing a keynote presentation for the push festival at the next week and I'm going to be talking a lot more about that distinction between inclusion and intersectionality but I think that intersectionality is my tool uh, and I use that to identify problems inclusion which is commonly used uh, views me as an individual as the problem. I am the problem that needs to be included. Oh, you can't do that because you're deaf. Whatever are we going to do? That is the premise underlying the idea of inclusion. In contrast, intersectionality takes a whole different perspective. If we accept this idea of approaching things intersectionally, then we can do anything. We can approach any problem through the lens of intersectionality. And none of us is ever the problem. We together can identify what the problem is, external to any one of us, and collectively we can use our strengths and our perspectives to solve that problem. So when Ravi and I work together, and I've got a little bit of a story, but I think I might hold it for later. So, but we'll, we, we've talked a lot about this. I just want to add to what uh, Don is saying about intersectionality and diversity. I, I, I agree, you know, I've been involved with film and uh, gone to meetings and pitched ideas to get funding, but I don't have an interpreter, right? But they say, oh, this is a diverse or a diversity inclusion type event, but I don't feel like I am because therefore I have to resort to using pen and paper to communicate. You know, that's true, you know, we see that term used but it doesn't really apply to us. You know, we should, if we're really going to have diversity and inclusion, then we should have sign language interpreters at these events. You're right, you know, it's inclusion, but we're sort of down there somewhere, not really a part of anything. And we need to bridge that gap. And um, I mean, it's probably going to be an 80% uh, achievement uh, status, but I think it's an ongoing work. You know, having to always open doors and knock on doors and, and get, get the message out there, but you can't give up. And definitely have to keep advocating, and you, knew, you know when you come across those people that need that change, right? Diversity, I see that word, and I believe in it wholeheartedly, which for me means everybody, you know, no matter what, how you get around, how you communicate, your sexual orientation, um, and, and Romeo and Juliet, um, again, that was an example. I had straight people, I had the LGBT community on stage, I had all ages, you know, from teenager to someone in their 60s, learning disabilities, you name it. Everyone was present in that performance. And it was a masterpiece. I'll never forget. It was stunning to see how all of us, and we did this for three years, how we worked together. I, I missed that, that was my, that was a community, and I'm still in touch with those individuals, and they've gone on various projects, they're doing well for themselves. But uh, you know, now I, I, you know, it's it's not there. I want to start that over again. But these things they come to an end. Eventually, one day we'll see this. And I'm not. I'm. I'm certainly. We're not talking about giving up. We're gonna. One day these these things will happen. Um, I was just gonna say real quick. 
we've been saying like it's hard and there's problems. It's also a lot of fun, <laughs> and and uh, fun because uh, I would say specifically in this process, um, so many of us, uh, the the joy and pleasure of learning a new language and a new culture is so uh, fun. Uh, if you've ever had that opportunity to travel somewhere where you need to learn and communicate and uh, confuse and um, uh, yeah, it's fun. It's worth it. <laughs> Questions, maybe? Yes. Um, how do you guys feel seeing in the media um, people with disabilities being portrayed by people without a disability? Like, um, what's that TV show where the doctor has autism? but the actor actually doesn't have autism? If I may, I'd like to address this. I think it's an excellent question and I'm happy that you've raised this. Um, you know, there's certainly been a lot of discussion about that in the deaf community where we see hearing people being hired to act deaf that I believe that that is simply and purely unethical. I think, and it applies in other communities as well. Um, we would never uh, have a white actor in blackface, you know, doing a black role. We don't do that, but we do it with deaf people. And as a performer, I recognize that we are all acting, and many people say it's just acting. That's what we do. We act people that we aren't. But when we look at all of the layers and ethical questions that get raised by this instance, I. I'm not speaking for others, but I'm speaking for myself as a deaf person. When I look at that, it's entirely and completely evident immediately that this person is not deaf. It's so clear to us um, that, you know, whether this person is deaf or hearing, this person playing a deaf role. Um, you know, I can see, I can identify if this is a hearing person who's signing and pretending to be deaf or if this is somebody who's pretending to be, you know, maybe deaf but from another, use, uses another sign language. So ev those things are eminently clear to us. So that's one issue that gets raised. The second issue that gets raised is when we look about the audience, when deaf children never see themselves represented in the media, deaf kids never see themselves on TV. And what they see, representations of deaf people that they see on TV, don't match what they know is true in their real life. So that is a real clear problem. I think representation is important. And again, when we look at inclusion as a system of, of providing that representation, what is it that that means? How does that actually work out? And what do we think of as acceptable? Because what what we think of is, is, is no unacceptable, but is accepted by people out there who are making decisions. We were born this way, and that ought to be celebrated. We ought to be able to find ways to celebrate who we are. We are not tragedies. When my dream is that when hearing parents find out that their child is deaf, they see this as an opportunity to celebrate. And imagine the possibilities for that deaf child in the world and what a contribution that deaf child will make to their family and their world to learn a new language and to learn a new culture. So representation is a real key part of that because if we are seen in the world, in the media, in, on TV, if that becomes something that is imaginable, that we are seen, we are okay, we are a joy, we are celebrated, then children can see that that is a possible future for them. And that, that who they are is accepted and celebrated in the world. And I think that's so, so key. And as well as in theater, when I think about the deaf character and they bring in a hearing actor, someone who's mediocre at best in using the language, they're not able to portray adequately. You know, it's like, it's like taking a painting, you know, and, um, you know, it's like taking a copy of a painting and saying that that copy is a representation of the original. 
you know, the original score, the original painting, or the original portrayal or character needs to be kept as is. You can't modify that, and you can't duplicate it by bringing someone else in there. You, you send the wrong message. Uh, media is very powerful, as we know. It's everywhere. You can't get away from it. You know, it's 24 hours, non-stop. It's, it's non-stop. Oh. And the wrong message that if we do it this way that we're just talking about, it will just perpetuate the same mythology. I'd like to just add and respond to that. And I'm sorry to say that there is a lot of negative representations of people who are deaf on TV. And they're not believable, but they're out there. I mean, my God, they're out there hearing people are seeing that, and that is supposed to be us. And I see it every day. I confront it, I see it, I know it, and 80% of the time, something will come of it, something will happen, and it's because of ignorance. It's because of ignorance, misunderstanding, the perpetuation of myths, stereotypes. This is all done about us, and it has an impact on us. Yeah, I'll just add, so everything that we're talking about right now is called ableism. And so ableism isn't even in the conversation, right? So we have some language around racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia, but when you say ableism, we're not sure what that is. So I, again, challenge everyone to just go look up that word. So the other thing is that 20% of Oscars are won by people portraying people with disabilities. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that shows you where we are. It's this great thing to be able to dig into a character that has challenge and difficulty and um, I think that that's a, a good indicator of where we are. When we know that that is not okay, as Don mentioned, blackface, we know that that would never be, never be accepted. But it's the same thing. It's the same, and it's an analogy. It's not perfect, but it's, and that's where we are, that we're still, um, yeah. Other questions? Right, so again, getting back into the, the time and money that's spent on training a person who's hearing, who doesn't know the language and all of that, compared to bringing a deaf actor who has that ready to go. I mean, just think about from an economics point of view, that's just, it's, it's a no-brainer. And it's funny when you say that, when you look at, you know, Hollywood would be willing to pay, you know, millions for somebody just to learn sign language. And it takes 25 years to learn the language. What are you even doing? But they, they're, of course, but they won't be willing to pay an interpreter to get, so they can have a deaf person on set, right? And who could play that role with authenticity? So, I mean, it's, it, it's the ironies, right? Um, I have a question, is that, um how would you like to be um, addressed or portrayed on the media? Um, what kind of um, pronouns or uh, nouns would you like to see more on the media? And what kind of images do you would like to see more on the media? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my question. Thank you. Um, well. I've never really thought about it, that question before, but I guess I would like to see, um, I would like to see more of a focus on what we can do instead of what we can't do. I think that, you know, many questions, uh, when I do interviews, um, you know, I'll sit down and have an interview with somebody and many people, you know, begin it with, wow, you're deaf, you can't hear. How could you possibly be an actor? How did that happen? And I'm like, Ugh. You just saw me perform, so clearly I'm an actor. So how can, uh, why are you even asking me this question? Why is it a concern for them? Why is my being deaf such an issue for them as opposed to focusing on what we can do, what we do do? So I would like to see more of a focus on that in the media. We, we have ears, they don't work. Everything else is fine. Uh, you know, that's, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, like, 
like, you know, I get the question too, how can you possibly do that? Well, it's just common sense, you know, I train, I, I rehearse, I get it. And I remember when I was in high school, and off at Gallaudet University, I'm learning English, I, I'm French born. So one teacher said, oh, you, you, you went to Gallaudet? Are you thinking you're going there rather? That's not gonna happen. You know, come on, you're deaf. You know, let's, let's talk, let's talk reality. I mean, you want to be an actor? That's that's a dream. You know, you're, you're shooting way too high. And I remember thinking, uh, this is not going to work for me. My father says, no, you go off to university. And this person who I had this conversation with had become an interpreter. And I said, you got to be careful with what you say. You know, words are harmful, but I proved you wrong. You know, deaf in the minds of some people means, oh, you can't hear. Let's Let's put out the limitation umbrella. And, you know, and everything else is going to fall by the wayside for you. You know, it's like, so you can't hear. No, I have a whole access to a world through my eyes. I see the world. And if I don't know something, I learn it. And I research it. And I explore it. That's, yeah. And just to add to what Denise is saying, uh, when Peter opened, uh, um, you know, we talked about the impact of language in your land acknowledgement, and that language is powerful and does work. And I think that I use the intersectionality view regularly uh, because I challenge this idea of inclusion. And I think I use the language of inclusion and intersectionality as a lens to challenge uh, people's thinking. And I often, one example of that is I often say, you know, hearing people say, oh, you can't hear. And I say, no, no, I don't hear. And to me, that that's a, a simple distinction, just about removing the word can't from vocabulary, because how we use language is important. And if we look at, and I'm, this isn't just in English, but, you know, here we are in, in Canada, if we look at, uh, the language, we can see how much oppression exists in the actual language, in the vocabulary that we use. Yeah, can't hear. Uh, yeah, I can hear actually a little bit. I can feel music, I can feel the vibration, I can hear the bass. If I put my hands over my ears, maybe not, but I mean, people who, who uh, the word deaf is a general term. People have residual hearing. Some people are 100% deaf. My father is hard of hearing. Um, he identifies as deaf. So it, it, it means many, many things. But you're right, you can't generalize. And to say you can't hear, or you don't have enough hearing, or you have no hearing, but to say to someone you can't, you have no business saying that. You don't know anything about the person. <laughs> so I'm just catching and letting the interpreters get their mics in order. Uh, I think another thing that is important to note is that nobody, and I mean nobody, has the right to say no to a child. Any child, deaf child, hearing child, black child, white child, you cannot say no regardless of whether they're physically disabled, whatever it is that child's life experience will be, nobody has the right to restrict it and to restrict their imaginations for what's possible for them in their future. And I know that from experience because I got a lot of no's when I was young from teachers. I had a lot of people who told me, no, I couldn't do this. And look at me, I'm, I've got an, a master's in physical theater. I'm working with Ravi Jane. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, th this is what is possible, and I think it's so key uh, at, for deaf children, 90% 90, 90 of whom are born into hearing families. Only 10% of deaf children come from deaf families. And yes, you know, sometimes deafness is genetic, but uh, there are 250 different causes for deafness, so, you know, we don't always know who you know wh wh where our families are going to what our families are going to look like, and so you know people say, even deaf people say sometimes that deaf you know it's it's hard to be deaf, and I just find it so frustrating. I want to say no to that. My dream, 
my ambition and my goal, and this is what I always say, you know, my, my, my mom is right here, uh, she says, from the day I was born, I wouldn't take no for an answer. Isn't that right, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's really, really, you know, it's an important. And yes, that I think that people are sometimes, if, <laughs> you know, there is fear. There is fear that needs to be overcome. But to me, I think, you know, no, the word no becomes fuel for my passion. Just tell me no something and watch me come and bring it on because I will prove you wrong. But I do feel at the same time that that is an obligation. Nobody should have to work so hard their whole lives to prove people wrong who've told them no. I think it's not fair and it's not right and it's got to stop from you know, looking at what, how we respond to our children. Ravi and, and uh, Dawn work together, and um, the, the, they're working together on The Tempest, right. and Denise and I, pardon me. And um, I mean, my vision would be to have a, a cast of hearing and deaf people. You know, um, this, is, this is just right up my alley. This is what I want to do. So I responded, and I thought, okay, we'll see what happens. And, you know, I got a response. And um, I met Ravi, and instantly I knew, hey, this is it. I, this is where I want to be. And I felt like there was no power differential. This is just my dream come true. And I knew I had to take advantage of this and do this. And um, when I when I got the call, I just burst into tears because oh, I couldn't believe I couldn't believe it. This was like a dream come true for me. Uh, Landon. So the, uh, in my journey uh, as an artist, I haven't had any deaf mentors. It's been an isolating experience for quite some time. And I thought inclusion would solve the issue. But uh, for many years, I, I, I don't know, okay, hearing people are my, are my mentors. I mean, they have good intentions. However, I, I found out that, like you talk about intersectionality, it's, you know, I, I think about the four of us, or the four of you, like how, how was that achieved? Like what, what was the most important piece of the intersectionality? Because I think that concept alone is, is a brand new one for me. So when I think about, or I hear you talking about intersectionality, like what, is that, what does that look like? Well, um I had an experience in London when I was there studying my master's in fine arts. It was the most difficult experience of my life. I came home at the end of the every day in tears because I was so isolated and alone. And I will discuss this experience more in my keynote next week, but it was an extremely oppressive experience. And I feel that I am very grateful that I had a career in theater before trying to do that because it would have been so discouraging otherwise. Um, I have had experience working with deaf and hearing people together and then when I went to school there, um, they gave me such a hard time just because I was deaf and I spent a long time struggling to, to figure out how it was. Now they, I graduated top of my class and they used me to, to instruct by the end, but that MA in physical theater with distinction, they told me it was the first time in their school's history that a drama had student had achieved over 90 for uh, their drama program, that it was unheard of in this program, and yet I achieved it. And they were blown away, but their comments that they made um, were really, I mean, I wrote my thesis about deaf and hearing people working together, and their last word to me was, well, I don't know that it's really possible for deaf and hearing people to work together. And I thought, what have I been doing here all this time? I just graduated top of my class. We've, I've written about this, we've shown this, I've demonstrated it. And I, it, uh, that experience put me into a significant depression after, for months after I was thinking, how do I respond to this? I don't know how to come out of this. Either I'm gonna let this influence my, me moving forward or I'm going to use this experience as my fuel. And so that led me to do a little bit of research and to the stumbling on these ideas of intersectionality. 
And, you know, I had to sort of think outside the box because I was really wanting to challenge both hearing and deaf people. I think that deaf people are very accustomed to the system as it is and quite passive uh, and, you know, happy to get whatever crumbs you get, regardless of, you know, what, how, how poor and diminished they are relative to other people's experience, they're still grateful to get them. And so I had to challenge people to say, you know what, we need and deserve more than that. And so I'm looking at things from a deaf perspective, and I look at hearing people from a deaf perspective, and, and that's you know, an, um, a, an important lens to have. So the intersectional piece has come from that. So I, I was working with a director named Josette Bushnell Mingo. Bushmingo. Thanks, Ravi. And uh, who will be working with Denise and Ravi. Um, so I found a lot of similarities between uh, Josette and Ravi, actually. So we've had, you know, had conversations, Josette and I had conversations, and this idea of intersectionality has come from that. And she uses that, she's a black person who uses intersectionality as a lens to advocate for her rights. Uh, and that, in that, context and I think that it's been really helpful for me as well and it really helped to explain my experience of all my you know life experience was really enlightened by this concept challenges that we've all faced so I think that that intersectionality it becomes a tool that we can use to explain things and how we can achieve a little more uh, interaction hel in healthy ways between our worlds that there are, you know, deaf people in the theater and there are hearing people who do theater and neither of those worlds are interesting to me. They're only interesting when they come together. And this is what's really exciting. And I think that Prince Hamlet is one really good uh, e example of it. It's not the only example. There are others, but it's one really good example. And I think, you know, Ra Why Not and Ravi are you know really encouraging of me to you know begin to imagine what it could be like for me to have my own theater company where we can continue to explore these conversations and discussions. Yeah, Push Festival. Um, I've started working with uh, I don't know where she is, Annika. She's fantastic. There she is. <laughs> you are a lovely human being and. Um, you know, you, you've made things happen. We've had a great working relationship together, and I think that's also another example of intersectionality. But you're right, I think there's still room to grow. There's still changes to come, and those changes will lead nothing but to better circumstances where people are treated equally and collaborate and not sort of segregating and working in separate, you know, and cross, uh, cross purposes. So I think it's really important to have that attitude from the beginning, if, if you don't, if you want to work at cross purposes, then we will continue to work, um, you know, separately. So I think that intersectionality, um, we talk about deaf and hearing, um, will have an impact in other areas. If we don't get together, there will be no changes in, in the larger scheme of things. You know, I used to think, Deaf people have it right, and hearing people are idiots. But now, I mean, I was full of anger then. I often w I went off to university and, and learned a few things along the way. And, um, you know, hearing university and their theater programs, I started to realize, yeah, they are very different, and they really haven't talked much to each other. And how do we get them to start working together? But, you know, that's the intersectionality piece. You know, I think e each camp has the wrong information. You know, you might have a conversation with one person from one side and, or from one university and one from another program in university. They were very good, but they don't share, they don't exchange ideas. So uh, I think <laughs> it's going to be pretty cool. I'm really f looking forward to this, working together. I would say practically speaking for us in our process was um, uh, a lot of trust. Um, and establishing that trust uh, meant really understanding what we meant by collaboration, what we meant by specific words, and really defining them and ensuring that we understood that, okay, when you say this word, this is what you mean. I can't think of an example right now. Um, uh, yeah, equity, uh, equity, really understanding what an equitable experience for the audience would be for a hearing audience and a deaf audience. And we spent a lot of time talking about, well, okay, if a deaf audience isn't gonna understand this part, then a hearing, like we need to balance that experience. There are times where a deaf audience won't understand, and there's times when a hearing audience won't, won't understand. We wanna make sure that that experience is equal. 
So defining words and, and establishing a trust that we understood uh, that we were both achieving those values. And uh, power, I think, is the biggest one, which is, I think, a lot of times um, in a process we want to collaborate with people, but we want to control what the outcome is. And for me personally, uh, a, process can, a process with me can feel very chaotic because it can feel like nobody's leading or, uh, or there are a lot of chefs and I spend a lot of time being told what's not working. <laughs> And I'm, and I'm fine with that. I'm open to receive that feedback. And, uh, and from that process of continually listening to what's going on in the room, we then find the, the right thing of what it should be. But it requires a real distribution of power. And for a lot of the process, Dawn in particular, because sign and ASL was so integrated in the, in the aesthetic of the show, um, you know, I feel like we, co-directed in a lot of ways, or we, we all co collab we really collaborated on the piece as a whole. Um, we have time for, I think, one more question. We're almost at four o'clock. Um, Don showed me a, a document earlier today that sort of spoke a little bit about allies, and it came up again today. And I just kind of wondered if everyone can um, sort of a word of advice for allies and what resources or what's the, you know, how to be a better ally, I guess, is the question. I, I really believe in this one size uh, fits one. So, and, and that is like challenging every assumption that we have, we think we know, uh, we may not know. Uh, I'm also part of the queer community, which is not a community at all, it may shock you, but a collection of allies that are very, very different and try to support each other's um, causes and places in life. But for me, the, the key word of ally is assumption. And so the willingness to bear being wrong, the willingness, you know, in terms of uh, inclusion, I, I agree, let's scrap the word, let's talk about belonging, let's talk about what does it mean for you to feel like you belong here? And one of those things is never just one of us. So, you know, you, we'll have gatherings and, you know, and it'll be one of this kind of person, one of this kind of person, never just one. Come on, invite two. You know, so, so we as allies, it's good to be self-aware. You know, what do I need to belong? And be able to really think about that. And then to be able to ask that question. In, when we do devise process, we, we do a letter of inclusivity. I think we'll, we'll change that to letter of belonging. And uh, it's like, what, what do you need? Because I can't anticipate what you, what you need. And so it, it's um, always checking in. Everybody's changing all the time. It, you know, I'm a parent and my daughter's 27 now. I, I try to meet her fresh every time I meet her because she's not three anymore. And if I treat her that way, uh, I will not be included. Um, but to, to meet, you know, it's, it's just like shared humanity. It's basic kindness. I actually want to make a ma uh, an app and instead of uh, modeled on Grindr, which, but except we call it Kinder. Um, <laughs> so we can just kind of meet up. And, but I do think it's that. To be a good ally, we have to ask questions. And also, uh, we can ask questions, and a person has the right to say, that's not my job to educate you. And then you can ask, then my next question is, can you tell me who I can ask? And then if they say no, then I, I still have to find out a way, right? But it's to not put the burden of education on, on people and to stay open and, again, to find the shared humanity, which art does best. And seeing that show, it, I just wanted to speak to that too, the balance between the hearing and the, as a hearing audience. I wondered, if, was there a, a deaf critic has a deaf critic re reviewed the show? Yeah, because I just thought it can't be reviewed properly, right? You know, it can be reviewed from one side, but uh, uh, that balance held beautifully from, anyway, I don't know if that helped at all. I tend to ramble. <clears throat> if I could just add to what you were saying, JD. Um, I, there was one woman, I forget her name uh, in the US, a black woman who said uh, something which struck me so deeply 
um, and you know, I'm always trying to be a good human, you know, and uh, and you know, I come from you know a, a deaf perspective, but I look and learn from people who are struggling in other communities, Indigenous people, Black people, people with different abilities, and I think that you know, I cannot, and I you know, cannot say I understand you. It's not allyship to say, oh, I understand you, because we can't. I think it's allyship to say, I want to listen to you. I want to support you in the way that you want to be supported uh, and the way that you want me to be involved. Not to watch your struggle, but to be involved in it. And I think that you know, if I am able to admit where I'm wrong, then there, then there's room for change, and then there's room for you know advancement of all of us to move forward together. And again, you know, as a deaf person, I'm working with Ravi as a hearing person and other hearing people. I think that the more that hearing people have become aware of their hearing privilege, that helps me because I know you know, that I need you to achieve my goals. I need you, Ravi, to achieve my goal. And I need to be with hearing people in order for us to, to make these bridges of collaboration and working together. So I think that, you know, those, those things are so, are so key. And if I, I, I'll just want one more thing before I finish. Uh, in, it's kind of funny, but we did the Hamlet show, and then two years later, all of a sudden, you know, the people that I had been working with are learning how to sign. And I have to say how rare that is, that it's, and how beautiful my, my you know, mom and sister were, were shocked at how well we as a cast are communicating uh, with each other. And I've worked uh, as, you know, a professional actor for 15 years, and this is just the best experience with the best group of people for so many reasons. And, you know, I consider, you know, that the director is the lead of the show and, and Ravi is willing to listen, is willing to engage, has been transparent from day one of this process. And so two years later, <laughs> in rehearsal, he's like, hang on a second, what are you saying? He's catching me on lines that I'm doing wrong in <laughs> ASL, in rehearsal. And I think this is amazing. <laughs> Uh, so Ravi's learned how to sign. Sometimes the interpreters will come forward and be like, yeah, no, stand back, we got this. Because as a cast, we're engaging with each other directly. And again, you know, two years ago, the show was great. But two years later, you know, when we've been able to talk about some of the scenes, how, and I brought it up, how can we, you know, enhance what it is? And without a breath, Ravi said yes. Yeah, said, yes, let's do it, we've got the time. And a, a lot of the time, you know, Ravi knows what the problems are. But then we, you know, we have the time to address it. And it really took two years. Things take time. Things don't happen overnight. It takes time to sort of percolate and understand the process. And I'm always, you know, bringing forward, ASL is a language. This is my experience as a deaf person. We are a marginalized community. And this group, this cast, this crew has really seen that as, you know, an opportunity for me to engage as an equal. And our languages are treated equally and respected equally. And I think that that doesn't happen. I know many people may be aware of Spring Awakening, that, you know, that was a big show that happened in the States. Um, some, you know, Americans from the States who had seen Spring Awakening and came to then see our show, and this is their words, not mine, uh, that, you know, their response to our show was that it was a better experience of equal representation of languages than Spring Awakening was. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, I don't know what to say after that. Love you, Ravi. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is great what we're seeing up here. And I think the theme is, you know, hearing deaf people, they might be like, oh yeah, whatever, we, we see this, we hear this, but many heads, you know, are better than one. You know, that's a team. And um, 
Ravi, of course, and uh, Dawn, of course, have your own abilities and, and, and talents and, and expertise that you're sharing, but you bring that together to form a team. And otherwise, if you don't do it that way, it doesn't work. It collapses in on itself. Um, I think leadership training is, is key. You know, many leaders, you know, people who are heads of things and, and know that in order to bring ideas to fruition, you have to work as a team, you have to collaborate and things will take off. Otherwise, things just become, you know, raw and competitive and things don't materialize. So we have to work together and it has to be a good uh, connection. And if it's there, then it'll take off. And I'm so looking forward to working with you. Um, and we'll, one of the things we've been hearing uh, is the, the theme of time and the necessity to have time. Unfortunately, we are at time. <laughs> um, so I apologize. I, if you, uh, we have to sort of clear the room fairly quickly. But if you want to linger in the hallways and, and engage with our panelists one on one, please <coughs> feel free to do so. Um, and will you join me in thanking Ravi, Don, Denise, and JD for an excellent conversation? Thank you.